Well, this is our brand new series. We started this last Sunday uh, talking about making a difference. And we're studying about some of the uh, Christians in the book of Acts, the uh, early believers, to see what we can learn from them. And uh, just by way of review, if you were here last Sunday, what did we say? The one word was, what makes a difference? That was the one thing we talked about last week. We said, this will make a difference. What was our lesson last week? Those who were taking notes and diligently. Say it, Megan. You, you mouthed it. Come on. Relationships make a difference. Uh, we talked about the fact that as we form relationships, as we build and maintain relationships, that, that has the ability to make a difference. Um, <clears throat> and so this morning, we're going to kind of just move from where we were in the book of Acts at the end of chapter 2 right into chapter 3. And we will see this morning that caring makes a difference. We're going to look at one thing every single week. So relationships make a difference. Caring also makes a difference. We could kind of say that the theme of the lesson this morning uh, is this, that to make a difference, we must demonstrate the care and concern of Jesus Christ to those in need. To make a difference, say this with me, we must demonstrate the care and concern of Jesus Christ to those in need. And if we'll take that and we'll focus on it this week, we can see how caring will make a difference. Uh, Acts chapter 3, and we're going to uh, look at the uh, first 10 verses of this passage. We've got Peter and John. They had gone uh, to the temple, and verse number 2 tells us that they encountered a certain man lame from his mother's womb. So we have this man that is uh, crippled, unable to walk. He says he was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. So we have this man who's disabled, they carry him to the temple. Uh, he's a beggar. And so he sees Peter and John and he asks them to give him something. Verse number 4 tells us that Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of him. So here's this man. This is the only way that he makes money is by people coming by and giving him things. And so he asked Peter and John... Have you got something that you can give me? You know, maybe he's got a change bucket there. And Peter, you know, sees him, looks on him, fastens his eyes, it says. And he begins to dialogue with him. And it says that the man expected to receive something of him. So he's building up a little hope here. Verse number six. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Oh, man, he said, I don't have any, I don't have any money to give you. Well, this probably isn't what this man was looking to hear, is it? But such as I have, give I thee. Oh, he's going, he's, he's going to give him something greater than some silver or some gold. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. In reading about this passage, uh, there are several who say that this man uh, was around 40 years old. Maybe he had never walked a day in his life. And he stands up. And verse number 8 says, Leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Suddenly that silver and gold, the, the change that Peter or John could have given him, it wasn't as important as what just happened. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Peter and John interact with this man uh, there at the temple. Uh, caring makes a difference. Caring doesn't come naturally naturally. Uh, Spirit-filled believers in the first century, they didn't just care for the people within the church, and we talked about that last week in some detail. 
but they also cared for those outside of the walls of the church. And so Peter and John, these are uh, two men that we're going to see that had compassion on this man. They represented their Savior well. They were disciples of Jesus. They were followers of Jesus. They were what we now call Christians. And so they were demonstrating that they were followers of Jesus by the way that they acted, by caring. They reached out in love to care for this person. Uh, this man, he didn't have anything to offer them, did he? There was nothing that this man could do for them. But they still reached out. And what was the result of it? By doing this, God was glorified by their care. And you know what? He's glorified today when we look beyond our own needs uh, to the needs of others. And so we'll look from these two early church leaders this morning at this theme, caring makes a difference. Uh, when Paul wrote to the believers in the book of Philippi, he spoke of two men uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus, and talked about how they were very caring men. They were among his small group of loyal helpers. Uh, and in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 20, Paul sort of uh, laments the fact that there's a lack of others who would naturally care for the well-being of those in Philippi. Amen. Paul says that one of the marks of being a Christian is that we care for others. And so Jesus, at this point, Jesus, he's been crucified, he's died, he's been buried, he's resurrected, and now he's gone back to heaven when we get to this point in the book of Acts, right? So Jesus is now working through his disciples at this point. And Jesus is still working through his disciples today. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. We're to be followers of him. And there's one thing that Jesus wants people to know, and that's that his presence and his power are still at work, and it's still available to men. And the love and the great concern that our Lord has for the world, it's still being manifested through us. Amen. And I like this. Uh, I don't know who it was that wrote this, but somebody pointed this out. They said that Jesus today has no feet but our feet. No hands but our hands. No voice but our voice. He's left us. We, we hear people talk about being the hands and feet of Jesus. That's literally what we're talking about. That's what Peter and John were doing in this example in Acts chapter 3. They were caring for someone. And we need to exercise care for others. And so uh, from these two church members, we're going to look at three components of genuine care this morning. Number one, we'll see the plight of the needy man. The plight of the needy man. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried. They laid him daily at the gate of the temple to ask alms of them that entered. Uh, the inconvenient reality is this. The opportunity to care, it always begins with a need. If you want to be able to care for somebody, the opportunity to care, it begins with a need. And we tend to avoid uh, needs. Why? Because, well, I've got my own needs. I don't have time to take care of somebody else's needs because I've got my own. Don't bother me with needle, uh, needy people because I am needy. That can be our attitude if we're not careful. We have to guard against that kind of attitude. But if we want to make a difference, and that's what this whole series is about, making a difference, then we have to strive to express care for others. Uh, this man that we read about in Acts chapter 3, he had three, at least three, needs. Number one, he needed strength to walk. Here he is laying on the ground unable to walk, helplessly sick. We could say that he's very much a picture of those who are dead in their sins. Helplessly unable to have the strength to do anything on their own. That was all of us before we came to Christ. And increasingly we find ourselves uh, repulsed by the 
the wickedness and the depravity that we see in the world. I mean, we look at that. It doesn't take long to watch the news, to, to scroll through social media and see news stories every single week. You can begin to look at that and you can quickly see that this world is crippled by sin. And this is, I, I didn't put these verses in, but I'll read them to you very quickly. The prophet Isaiah, I mean, he, he sort of graphically portrays mankind's sinful condition. And if you kind of look at what Isaiah says about the people that he was writing to in his day and kind of think about our day, it sounds like he could have been writing about us. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 4, Isaiah wrote this, A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Does it sound like he's writing about today? Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt more and more. He says the whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up nor mollified with ointment. He talks about sin and how disgusting sin is. And it's, it, it's not new in our day. It wasn't new in the day of Isaiah. This goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, doesn't it? Men have been, in the book of Ephesians, I believe, it says we're dead in trespasses and sins. So how can we expect men who do not know God to have moral health or strength? And the fact that people are without strength, like this man that we're talking about in Acts chapter 3, isn't that exactly why Jesus came? Uh, we read this verse last week uh, in the book of Romans for our morning message. Romans chapter 5, verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength, like this lame man that we're talking about, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So we can kind of see a picture there are people who have physical needs and there are people who have spiritual needs. And as believers, we're to meet both of them. And we see that Peter and John, they did that. They met physical and spiritual needs. Not only did he need strength for walking, but he needed substance for living. Again, this man uh, crippled was asking for alms, asking for donations. He's a beggar. He needed financial assistance to meet the needs in his life. He was physically unable to earn an income. And we will meet people through the course of our week that have physical needs. And we can't meet every single need that we come across. You could probably be the wealthiest person in the world and still fail to meet every single need that people have. There, there's just not enough resources to meet all of the physical needs. But God may lead us to meet specific needs. And Jesus spoke of the importance of a caring spirit. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said this, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily say, verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The local church, our church, meets needs like this often. And many times the members in the church will meet needs like this. On a daily basis. Many times it's behind the scenes. There are needs that are met that, that never get talked about from the platform. That are never mentioned. There are many of you who will meet people's needs. Even anonymously. But that's what we're called to do. It's common for preachers and teachers, deacons, to visit... Uh, Widows, those in need, the sick. 
provide basic needs of life like groceries in times when the church has taken groceries to a family, when individuals have taken groceries to families to help them out. It's a form of caring, and it's something that we should do. You may pay a heating bill, put gas in somebody's tank, buy some clothes, pair of shoes. There are simple forms of caring like that that we're called to do. That's a mark of being a Christian. And then through the church, the church also meets needs like that many times. And we talked the other night, we had a budget meeting. You know, one of the things that the church does when you give your tithes, your offerings to the church, that helps to meet needs like that. And it's one facet of the caring work in our church. It's not the only thing that we do. It's not the, uh, there are some ministries that they think that that's the only form of caring that there is. But we ha we're called to meet physical needs and spiritual needs. And you ought to be thankful that you're part of a church that's carrying out this biblical uh, imperative of caring. Proverbs chapter 19 says this, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. That word pity, and we'll come back to that word pity again in a few minutes and kind of talk about that. But here's the next thing that this crippled man needed. We're talking about the plight of this needy man in Acts chapter 3. What did he need? He needed someone to care. How many people entered the temple that day or on every day before that that had walked by this man? But this man on this day, he noticed Peter and John specifically. He probably caught the eye of a lot of people walking in. But when he locked eyes with these two guys, there was some sort of hope that sprang up in him on this day. Somehow he knew or at least he hoped that they were going to help him. You know, there are many people, there are more people than we realize they're looking for a person to help. They're looking for a person to care. And God, he may desire that this week that you are the person that he can use in someone's life to help. You can be that person this week to care. If we think about the feeling of hopelessness, some of you may have experienced that in the past. The psalmist was not unfamiliar with this. In Psalm chapter 142, he said this. He said, I looked on my right hand, beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge filled me. No man cared for my soul. That feeling of despair, that feeling of hopelessness, like I just want somebody to care. Many of us could probably identify with that. And often what folks think they need is really far short of what God uh, really knows that they need. This man was hoping to receive some coins. But he was completely healed of his lifelong debilitating condition. People around us, you know, they may think, man, what I need is a new friend. What I need is... A new mortgage. What I need is a new job. What I need is a new car. What I need is a new church. But God knows that what they really need is Him. And He may choose you to be the messenger of care this week that goes to them, that begins to open up that door to where they, for the first time, realize that their need in life is God. And the question is, will you be that person this week? We can talk about this today and it all sounds good, but when we leave here and go home, will we put this into practice? Will we look for opportunities to do this? The second thing we see this morning is the pity of the caring men. We said we'll come back to that word pity. The pity of the caring men. Verse number six, we read this earlier. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. In Christ's parable on forgiveness, the, the master 
asked the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18. He said, shouldest not thou have also had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And Jesus asks us the same question today. I had pity on you. So shouldn't you have pity on others? What does that word mean? Uh, Matthew chapter 18 is the only time in the New Testament that we see it. It's not a word that we use a lot. Other words in Scripture that come from the same root word are the words mercy and compassion. So when you see that, Jesus said, I had mercy on you. Shouldn't you have mercy on others? I had compassion on you. Shouldn't you show compassion to others? And Peter and John teach us what it takes to demonstrate this type of compassion. That's what we're talking about, the, the pity or the compassion of these two caring men. Verse number 4 says that, that Peter fastening his eyes on him. He fastened his eyes on him. Uh, Jesus works through those who fasten their eyes on the need. It's not, just, it's not enough to just see the desperate need of the world. It's not enough to just see somebody that's hurting or suffering. We have to stop and we have to fasten our eyes on it. It's one reason why we have at Missions Emphasis Month. We will take the next three Sundays and we'll fasten our eyes on missions. Because we can talk about missions today and we think, yeah, that's good. Or we've mentioned missions on Wednesday nights. Yeah, we know our Wednesday night offering goes to missions. We hear from our missionary letters uh, every week or two. And then we might think about missions for a minute. But when we fasten our eyes on it, what does that mean? It means fixed attention, an earnest, intense gaze, continuous, steadfast attention. So when we dedicate an entire month to missions, we begin to realize how great the need is to reach people for Jesus Christ. Near and far. And we'll hear statistics from different missionaries and church planters. And we'll see things that will hopefully, as we fasten our eyes on it, if we intently gaze on the need of reaching the world, we'll begin to have compassion on those people that are lost. We'll have compassion and we'll begin to, to pray for somebody to reach them with the gospel. And then we'll hear from missionaries who are sharing their burden because they have a deep passion because they've been there. They've seen those people. They've spent time there. And so they fastened their eyes on a specific city, a specific state, a specific country, wherever they're going. And they have a desire to reach those people. And so as we watch their videos, as we listen to their words... We begin to understand why we need to have compassion on those people where they're at to reach them for Jesus. Most of the folks to cross this lame man's path throughout the years, you know what they did? They did what came naturally. It's what many of us do. Uh, when you go into Walmart and you see Salvation Army at Christmas time ringing the bell, what do we naturally do when we walk into Walmart? You're going to turn and you're going to look the other way, right? That's what we normally do. You see somebody, or you see somebody standing uh, at the end of an exit ramp, holding a sign. Is it natural to lock eyes with them? That's not what we naturally do, is it? We naturally look ahead, look away. You don't lock eyes with them. The people that were going into the temple that day did what came naturally. They looked the other way, and we have to retrain ourselves. We have to retrain ourselves. And we've all been guilty of it. We have to retrain ourselves to truly see people for who they are. It doesn't take long to, to, again, look at the news, read some news articles. When you look at people, what do you see? Today, some people will notice skin color. That's what a lot of people want us to talk about, isn't it? Clothing, hairstyle, the color of clothes social or economic status. But is that really what we're looking at when we are looking at people? 
if we're going to have pity, have compassion on people, if we're going to make a difference, then we have to see people as Peter and John saw this man, who they truly are, an eternal soul who needs Jesus Christ. Regardless of their status in life, their economic status, the color of their skin, their clothing, their hairstyle, where they live, their They have an eternal soul that one day is going to continue living outside of this world. And it's either going to heaven or it's going to hell. And we have the opportunity that we can care for them, but we have to retrain ourselves to look at it. Jeremiah, the man known as the weeping prophet, why did he get that name? Maybe because of what he wrote in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse number 51. He said, mine eye affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. Jeremiah began to get a passion for his people because of what he saw. He looked. He fastened his eyes on the need that was there. Similarly, when Jesus looked on lost souls of men with caring eyes, what does the Bible tell us about Jesus? Many times it will use words like this, he was moved with compassion. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 36, when he saw the multitudes, there it is, he was moved with compassion. Why? Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as a sheep having no shepherd. You know, some of us, we're like the blind man uh, in the book of Mark. Before Jesus finished healing them, the blind man uh, said that he saw men as trees walking. And some of us are kind of like that blind man. We need Jesus to touch our eyes so we can clearly see the needs that are out there. Next, this man needed caring hands. We see the caring hands that lifted the man. Caring hands. Peter and John, they did more after they fastened eyes, after they saw the need, after they experienced the emotion. You know what they did next? They took action. They took action. They placed their hands on this man. They they gripped his body. They helped him to his feet. They lifted him up. Just seeing, and again, in context of uh, everyday life or in the context of our missions month, just seeing and being concerned over the needs of the world doesn't meet the needs. You'll be moved over the next few weeks. You will experience some emotion, or I at least hope that you will, as you hear from different missionaries and as we talk about missions and as we focus on that and that fire begins to get stirred inside of you. You'll experience those emotions. You come across somebody in life. You hear some story. You you, you talk with somebody. You'll experience emotions. But we have to be moved into action. The need existed and Peter acted. In fact, he did something dramatic. He knew that the Lord cared, and he was the representative of the Lord. He was the ambassador, as Paul said. That's what we are. We're ambassadors of the Lord. We're representatives of the Lord here on earth because he's not here today. He's left us. Uh, Think about this. God's power alone uh, could have certainly enabled this man to have stood up and walked without the assistance of Peter John. Could could God have healed this man without Peter and John being there? He could have. But God chose to use Peter and John to accomplish the work. Could God just save everybody in the entire world today and just, you know, give everybody the gospel message? He could, but he left, and when he left, he left us behind. He left us with what we call the Great Commission to reach the world. He wants to use us. He wants to use his people to reach the world. God helps those in need by using compassionate people who are willing, there's the word, willing to become personally involved. That's the behavior that Solomon spoke about in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. He said, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. 
Now, there's a lot of things that Jesus did while he was here on earth that we can't do. Walk on water. We can't do it. Uh, cleanse lepers. We can't do it. Raise the dead. We can't do it. But you know, there is one thing that Jesus did while he was here on earth that we can still do today. We can reach out our hands to lift up those who are in need. In Mark chapter 1, verse 31, it says this about Jesus. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Mark chapter 9, verse 27, it says that Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. When he walked on the water, Peter decided he wanted to as well, and he began to sink. He helped lift Peter up. Through all scripture, we see Jesus lifting people up. And when you lift someone up, in that moment, you've cared enough to get involved, you are like Jesus. We can't do those other things that Jesus did, but we can lift people up. Last week, we briefly talked about the, uh, the Good Samaritan, the man that had been uh, robbed, beaten, and left for, for dead there on the side of the road. Kind of goes in hand in hand with this story. There were some people who walked by that man, weren't there? There were people who saw that man laying there. They saw the need. But what did they do? They looked the other way. But the Good Samaritan came by and we said, uh, I talked about how David Gibbs talks about there's those who go through life beating people up and passing people up. But then you have people like the Good Samaritan who come by lifting people up. That's what Jesus has called us to do, to lift people up. Let me ask you this question. Who have you lifted up recently? That can be a very thought-provoking or even a convicting question to think about. What does it mean to lift someone up? A kind word can lift someone's spirits. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. There's life and death in the power of the tongue. Our words have impacts. So yes, even a word spoken at the right time. I think we watched that movie Sheffy at church a while back. As you read through his life, you'll see that before he felt like he was called to preach, what did he do? He wanted to just travel to go help at revival meetings because during the invitation, he would see someone who may be under conviction and he would go up and just speak a word to them in that moment because a word at the right time can make all the difference. So you can lift someone up by what you say. A phone call, a face-to-face conversation, a text message, You can get those. It doesn't cost you anything to give someone a kind word. It doesn't cost you anything to encourage someone. But it can make all the difference for someone to help lift them up. A thoughtful act can lift someone's burden. We talked last week about how the church, we're called. That's one of the benefits of being a member of a church is that we're called to bear one another's burdens. And so when we do a thoughtful act, it can help lift some of those burdens, and we can be like Jesus in that moment. Caring makes a difference. How else can we lift someone up? We can introduce them to a man named Jesus. And Jesus Christ can lift him directly from where he's headed to hell and take him all the way to heaven. And there's no greater lift than that, is there? And you can have a relationship with God and a home in heaven for eternity. So this week, will you lift someone up? And then lastly, let's see the praise of the healed man. Acts chapter 3 again, it says that he leaping up stood and he walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. He'd never walked before, but now he could. He'd never leapt before. But now he's leaping. 
He'd likely never entered the temple before. But now he entered unassisted. And that's not all he was doing. What else did it say there? He was praising God. His praise. This was a witness of God's power. His praise was a witness of God's power. The, the man's first response to this healing was to praise God. He wanted everyone to know that God had changed his life. In the book of, a, uh, the book of Ephesians, it says that we should be to the praise of his glory. Our lives should be a testimony that is glorifying God. The testimony of a changed life is a wonderful tool. You know, people can argue with our message. They can debate you all day long about the validity of Scripture and whether this is accurate or not or whether something is scientific or whether there's historical evidence that backs it up. They can argue with your message all day long. But, you know, they can't deny the message of a transformed life. It's kind of hard to argue with that. The skeptics find it hard to explain why someone doesn't talk the way that he used to. Someone who used to have a, a vulgar mouth no longer uses that type of language anymore. The skeptics find it hard to explain why the man who used to go to the places he used to go to get drunk, why he doesn't go there anymore. The substances he once abused, he no longer uses. The way he used to behave, he no longer behaves. A transformed life is a power that others just look at and they can't deny that something, and in reality we know someone, changed. This man changed from inside out. What does Paul tell us? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become New. His praise was a witness of God's power. Let your life be a witness of God's power. Your testimony is a wonderful tool. It's a, it's a wonderful way to witness. You can tell people, man, here is how Jesus has worked in my life. Yeah. And it's a good way to go into the gospel. This is how my life is different because of Jesus. We talked about that last week, living real authentic lives, people watching us. They're watching our lives. That's what we see next. His praise was watched by the people. Amen. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him. Notice those words there. It says, all the people saw him. For however many years he sat there, people going in and out of the temple daily and weekly, they saw him. This healed man... He didn't need to preach a sermon. You know why? Because he was the sermon. He just did what God had suddenly enabled him to do. And you know, it would be a good thing maybe in our lives if we just let our lives be a sermon. Just do what God has enabled you to do. What does that mean? Uh, show up to work on time. Live with integrity. Love your spouse. Raise your children to be godly. God has enabled you to do those things because people are watching to piggyback off of last week. And when we do those things, our lives act as a sermon. And when people ask, you know, how is it that you're able to do those things? You now have an entrance to a conversation about Jesus Christ and say, you know, it's all because of Jesus that this is happening in my life. Without Jesus, I couldn't do these things. And yes, in case you're wondering, Peter did get around to preaching a sermon. You can read verse 12 through verse number 26. Peter goes into a powerful message about Jesus Christ at this point. But you know, there wouldn't have been a crowd for Peter to preach to. There wouldn't have been a crowd for Peter to preach to if this man hadn't walked and leapt and praised God first. People were watching. And because of that, Peter was able to say to them in verse number 16, And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye now see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him 
hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. People who need God, people in your life that you're associated with in your circles that need God are watching. They're watching how we handle the ups and downs of everyday life. They're watching how we handle the ups and downs of the economy. They're watching how we deal with bad news from the doctor. They're watching how we treat our family members. They're watching how we live day in and day out. As a believer, you live in a fishbowl. You live in a fishbowl. And it's a wonderful place to live because you can give God glory because of it. Because you have an opportunity to bring people to Christ by the way that you live. Because people are watching. Jesus said that this fishbowl is a wonderful place to be. Here's what Jesus said about it. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. People are watching. And Jesus said, let people see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When you love people, when you care for people, when you love your family, when you love your spouse, when you show up to work on time, when you live with integrity, when you do all of these things we've talked about, you have the opportunity to live out Matthew 5, 16, to let your light shine before man. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. It's amazing what happens when people cared because two men, Peter and John, slowed down for a minute and looked over and locked eyes with a man that nobody else did. Everything in that man's life changed. And then the lives of a lot of other people in that crowd changed as well because they heard the gospel message and they got saved and their lives changed. They went and changed other people's lives. We talked last week about the book of Acts, the early church, how the Lord added to the church daily. How does that happen? Because two men slow down and talk to somebody that nobody else wanted to talk to and opened up a conversation. And people were saved, people were added, and it continued. Someone who doesn't have anything to offer, they cared for him. So will you care for the people? God's going to bring somebody across your path this week. You're going to have an opportunity to care this week. Will you make a difference by caring? God, thank you this morning for this lesson that we could study this morning from the lives of Peter and John. I pray that you would convict us where we need to be convicted this morning, Lord, uh, that you would allow your Holy Spirit to, to help us to see opportunities to care for people this coming week that we would live in a way that would bring honor and glory to you, that it would open up opportunities for us to share the gospel message. God, we pray that you would now meet with us in this morning's service as we celebrate the resurrection uh, on this wonderful Easter Sunday. We pray that you would uh, just have your will and way in the service, that you would move, that hearts would be touched, and Lord, that we might even see a soul saved today. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll take a